It's quite a long walk up here when I introduce the poets, so please, as ever, keep applauding as they walk up and applaud them as they leave. Our first poet up tonight is the fantastic Leoncia Flynn. I first heard of Leoncia Flynn before her first book came out way back in the early 2000s. And I was talking to somebody, I said, who are the new poets in Belfast, in Northern Ireland, that I should be watching out for? And this person was trying to tell me, but as he was trying to tell me, his voice was drowned out by a passing helicopter. So every time he, he says the great point, in, oh, I couldn't hear what he was saying. He was, saying he was trying to say the words Leoncia Flynn, but his voice was drowned out by the passing helicopter. Then suddenly, the helicopter cut its engines and because he thought it was still going round and round, he went, Leon Flynn, really loud. And I thought, yes, that's what Leon Flynn's poems are. They suddenly break through the noise. They break through and they quietly sit on our shoulder and tell us the most amazing things about life, about death, about love, about family, about dementia, about memory loss. But they're always there, always whispering in our ear, always telling us very, very profound things. Please welcome Leon Flynn. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read my enigmatic poem prefacing, prefacing the book. Um, and appropriate enough, it's called uh, For the Order of Events. In the beginning. <clears throat> In the beginning. <clears throat> when we had learned that Darwin wrapped his trunk in ice-cold towels, that Coleridge's inflamed humours would slink about his drug-racked form, we were like, whoa. Our bullshit was reframed as cogent suffering, and a martyrdom, noble and true, took shape, extending from the maladies that lately harrow us, her bloated, cramped, hungover, migranous, back through the mists of time, to some first cause. A kind of lady spider's bridge line spun out from some far off, not remembered room that splits and divides to hold as it unwinds the spectre of our fragile human flesh trembling on the tensed webs of our minds. Yellow lullaby. My mother wore a yellow dress. Uh, as McNeese wrote in his poem, Autobiography. And his mother was, I think, committed to, well, committed to an institution when he was, I think, six. Yellow lullaby. A spill of sunlight and a yellow dress. A yoke, a yellow flower, a candle flame. A moth-like moonlight in the nursery's darkness. Every time my daughter cried, I came barreling out like some semi-deranged trainee barista, friendly but perplexed. And in the dark of night, lo, I was there, perplexed and ratty when she cried again. And thereafter, on each new occasion that she cried, the form, the limb that moved, the light that shone, the hand that soothed her and the flesh that fed, the voice that wasn't silence that replied there in the night, so she was not alone. Not talking, I mean, with the unborn and the dead. At the same time as uh, curating my daughter's childhood, as I and her psychological development by not fucking off <laughs> and being institutionalized, I, uh, my father was dying of Alzheimer's, so this is for him. It's called Jared Manley Hopkins, who was my father's favorite poet. So we, his children, used to say that Hopkins was gay, which he may have been. And my father was a very tolerant man, but persisted to, uh, to protest that this was not the case. Jared Manley Hopkins. At the mention of Jared Manley Hopkins, my mild-mannered father, tender, abstracted, would exercise the right to revert to type, that is to say, devout that is prescriptive. He would rather we did not so bandy the good Jesuit's name about in talk of gay this and gay that. 
just as he would rather my sister did not from the library request sick Lolita. Like pantomime sailors, yo-ho, we roll our eyes. Somebody snaps on the poisonous gas fire heater and I'll put off a wave or for a year or two, the hypothesis. I'll form with the wave to provoke them to these wobblers that all in such matters swing from pole to pole. As Hopkins was wont, his muse being Binzi Poplars, to swing from joy's heights, alas, to the abyss, and for whom the mind had mountains, cliffs of fall. Oh, the mind, mind has mountains, cliffs of fall, frightful, sheer, no man fathomed, hold them cheap, may who ne'er hung there, who's not known the hell that fashions itself from the third night without sleep, the third or the fourth, in whose black margins crawl shrill horrors and were breathless, polaxed, pinned, as though in the teeth of an outrageous gale, the mind, sick, preys upon the stricken mind. And worse, there is none, no none than this wild grief, Cytalopram wired, our sweating selves, self-cursed. O Mary, mother of us, where is your relief, as Hopkins wrote, but far gone at its worst, it's her first form I want. Please stroke my hair. It's all right now. I'm here, I'm here, there, there. Not funny. This is called The Fish in the Berlin Aquarium. I like fish. Um, I think they're, I think they might be thinking. The Fish in the Berlin Aquarium. We had come to the Berlin Aquarium in the dead of winter, the tear garden snow cold and monochromatic, some slanted alpine light turning a few of the upper windows gold. Inside in the dreamlike corridors, we pressed towards the vivid turquoise tanks to see the grouper and Napoleon fish. They drift serenely from synthetic banks. Out of the wrecks of history, small domes and molded caves, such ersatz shrunken worlds, the fish drift up, placid, one, then two. They are large and fantastic as marine balloons and have oddly upholstered looking pearly heads. The surgeon fish and the gigantic wrasse, staring with rimmed eyes blank beyond our eyes. We move our fingers over the cool glass as though to tap, tap into their element which is clear and pale, blue and perpetual, like some outrageous Scandinavian dusk, framed and airbrushed. The fish are hyper-real, high definition almost in this space, and lift their bladder shapes through watery air, working the fleshy trapdoors of their mouths. Each moves its mouth perpetually in prayer and seems to be mouthing, I am, I am, I am, at intervals. We wonder what they know, performing their status unselfconsciously, organically, intent, and if this slow mime of their movements just beyond the glass makes them really beacons of bright calm beyond the faces they present for us, or mutely harrowed in their comfort zone. I'm just going to finish with a poem called The Glitch with another social media digital theme. Well, no, they weren't really fish, obviously. Um, sorry. Uh, the fish were metaphorical. Uh, so this is called The Glitch, uh, which is a poem I dedicated to 2016. And I'll go away after that. The Glitch. When the world threw up its hands and wobble tipped into dysfunction, Faction facing faction, posed in uncompromising opposition and posting their insults over the abyss, the logic binary, the tone de true. Well, it all seemed an outsized version of the glitch or gremlin in the works that harrowed us and jammed the comms. Male wrath meets female shame and panic. Now, too blindly passionate, our words contract round one another's throat. Who set the snares? who wired so weirdly wrong the circuits, the outrageous patriarchs sitting in state, or yes, the one that stalks up through your blighted childhood, hectoring and sowing fear might know we don't, we watch the displaced flee or freeze in alleyways. Our righteous take their vigils to the streets, 
homogenous, peremptory, and too late. Their cry re-echoed one of disbelief. Who woke us to the bad dream of our life? Who broke the loom and lobbed the first loud stone so that this mirror cracked from side to side that we'd eyeballed oblivious so long, shocking us roughly into adulthood? The year prolongs its asshole smash and grab, its wrecking spree, with us on separate coasts, hunched round the narratives of all we've lost, like two spectators on apocalypse. And searching for where the blame lies in this matter, we rifle bleakly through the micro data. Thank you very much.